So hi, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel and welcome to this interview with Carolyn Rhodes. Uh, as you know, the people who follow my YouTube channel for a bit, I try to do interviews with uh, very interesting people. And there's been a few interviews on my channel if you want to watch those. And if you're interested in the content, please follow my channel. So with this being said, um, I have Carolyn Rhodes here. She's the wife of Michael Rhodes, the recently deceased Michael Rhodes. And he is one was for me one of the most amazing spiritual teachers. Um, you know, I went to three intensives with him in 2013, 14, and 16 in the Netherlands with Irene and Andre, uh, beautiful people also. And um, I spoke to you, Carolyn, too, and I heard you speak. And then I, I, I thought then, too, you knew you had very interesting things to say, you know, about love and, and stuff like that. You worded very beautifully. Michael word, worded things very beautifully, but uh, you did, too. Uh, so I wanted to, I had this idea to do this interview with you. And, you know, maybe we can start because um, you've emigrated, actually, to Australia to, to live with Michael, as if I am correct, because um, you lived in, in the States. So, you know, first tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your life story, um, you know, how it went, how maybe how your spirituality developed. You know, you, you went to you emigrated to Australia, which was probably a huge step. How, how was that for you? So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, I'll just start from when I met Michael rather than go into the background before that. Uh, I actually I I got a catalog in the mail one day and I saw this book talking with nature and I never used to order books through catalogs. I always wanted them recommended. But for some reason that caught my eye. And so I ordered the book and it came in. And at the time I was doing uh uh, sessions, weekly sessions. I was having lucid dreams back in those years, and I was working with a dream interpreter who was also like psychic, and you could see auras and everything. He was a lot more than just a dream interpreter. And I mentioned about this book, Michael Rhodes, and he said, "Oh yes, Michael Rhodes. He's he's enlightened. He's you know he's really a great spiritual teacher." And da 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 da. I said, "Enlightened? Wow, that was like a big buzzword for me back in those years." And and uh, anyhow, Bill then went to see Michael, uh, who was speaking down in Columbus. I wasn't able to go that weekend. My then husband and I had other plans. And he came back and he said, Michael is definitely enlightened because he could see auras and he couldn't see Michael's aura because it was too vi vibrating too finely. He couldn't see. He could only see denser energies. And uh, he said also by his words and the energy he had. So I was very, very fascinated from that point and and uh, and got other my other books that he had at that time out. And eventually friends of ours went to see him speak in the at the Omega Institute in New York, and they invited him to come to America the following year and uh, to Cleveland, to our area, to do a couple of evening talks. And at that time, he and his late wife, Trini, were traveling around America giving evening talks and, and short seminars. And so they came the following year. And when they came, uh, Pam and Bruce, our friends that brought them in, their little boy got very, very ill and they ended up taking him to the hospital. So Jimmy and I, my my ex-husband, my husband, I call him, mm -hmm. and I took over hosting Michael and Trini. And that began a long, long friendship then, a very, very long friendship. We became very, very close, very fast. Obviously, it was not our first rodeo together. I think we both all known each other for a few, a few lifetimes anyhow. And uh, I started to organize for Michael in America then. That was back in the early 90s, 93, I think, 1992 or 93. And I organized for him uh, straight through. Uh, and then in 2006, when they came, that was when Trini uh, had been sick in Germany. And when they arrived in America, she was not doing well at all. In the morning, the retreat, retreat, our retreat, which we called them then, was going to start. Uh, she was taken to the hospital and she ended up uh, transitioning there quite suddenly from an abdominal aneurysm, which was really quite shocking. I mean, nobody, you know, we knew she was sick, but we didn't think it was it was going to end up in, in that. And that was a very, very difficult time, of course, for Michael. And we were all very, very close. Trini was a very, very dear friend of mine. And so the following year, when Michael came to America by himself, I didn't want to bring him to uh, our home where he stayed with Trini every year, you know, for 15 years. Uh, I didn't want to rekindle those memories with having her not being there. And so I met him at a mutual friend's out in Montana. And I met him there a week early. And at this point, my 
uh, ex-husband and I were already had been separated and he had moved back home, but it was, you know, it's like I've always said, there's nothing deader than a dead relationship. And, you know, we were good roommates and we laughed a lot together, a lot together, a lot together, a lot together, a lot together. I'm 16 months. And so Michael and I spent a week in Montana going to Glacier National Park with our friend Daniel. And at that time, a friendship love turned into a romantic love, quite surprisingly, quite organically, quite... You know, love just swept us away. I mean, it literally did. It literally did. And we were such good friends. We had really such a strong platform. And we were both very, very right-brained. And, you know, we just let right-brainers, when you're that right brain, we just see the world sort of in a different way. And and um, the rest is history. I ended up uh, immigrating to Australia uh, three months later. And uh, here I am. <laughs> that's a That's a beautiful story. And, you know, I just want to pick up on something you said that you said, uh, the fact that Michael was enlightened. And um, I actually, you know, felt this too during one of the intensives is like this energetic effect his his aura had on, on people. And I could really feel that. So that's very interesting that you say that because there's a lot of people claiming they're enlightened, but they aren't. But I knew he was one of uh, the real deals. Anyway, continuing on that. So you've emigrated to to um, to Australia. So I'm 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 in the process actually of immigrating to Canada with, with my wife Meg. We're living in Belgium right now. Um, how was how was that process for you? Because I imagine you have to leave a lot behind, right, when you emigrate. I mean, especially to Australia, it's like the other side of the world. How 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 did that feel for you? How was that process for you? Yes, it is. And interestingly enough, I was hugely attached. I have I, I as I wrote about on Facebook, maybe you read that I have dealt with every trauma in my life has had its roots in in deep attachment. And so for me to leave my home and my family and my my sons, both of my sons, they were grown, but still leaving your children and all my friends and and everything was a really big deal. Everyone was saying, I can't believe it that you're doing this, but I was so sure, you know, and it's like I said, love was just, having its way with us. There was no question in my mind, but that I was doing the right thing and that this was what I was meant to do. And because I had been to Australia twice before, we were here in 2000, my, my ex-husband and my two sons came to spend uh, a month over the Christmas holidays with Michael and Trini and their family. And then after Trini transitioned, I came for um, another month just, just to be with the family. Nothing was happening with Michael and I at that point. I mean, we were very, very close friends. And, um, you know, I was here just as an as a emotional support to the whole family, really. Uh, so I thought that I, because I'd been to Australia twice, that I knew what, you know, well, I've been there and they all speak English and, you know, it won't be that much of a change, but it was a huge change. It was really, really a huge change. You don't really realize until you, until you immigrate, till you, till you get to the, the country. And, uh, um, I, I left everything behind. I came with five medium-sized suitcases of my personal belongings that was about a tenth of what I owned. I had a small box of uh, photographs and a brown envelope of recipes, and that was it. I left everything else behind. I gave everything away, and um, uh, yeah, and here, here I am. And it was a little bit of adjustment, I have to say. When I first came, I was freezing. It was you know, it was springtime here. It was in September. I arrived in September and it was so cold. And Michael kept saying, oh, you won't need, you don't need any winter clothes. You don't need any winter. I could have brought a couple of transitional coats, you know, autumn and spring coats that would have helped. And we went out and got me a couple of heavier things. But um, it was, they don't have central heating here. And I'm used to that, of course, coming from the snow belt off of the Great Lakes. And so it was, and then going into the grocery store and all the brands and everything were different and and coming into like Trini's Kitchen, uh, which was very complete, but it was none of my, you know, when you, I, I, I was in my home for like, you know, I had my own home for 40 years before I immigrated and, and uh, all my favorite knives and my favorite bowls and all my things and everything was different. And so it was, a, it was a change. But you'll be taking all of your things, and it's not like you're moving into someone else's home. If you're you're immigrating to Canada, is that what you said? You're going. Yes, we're going to live in my my wife Meg is from Canada, so we're going to live in in Canada. Yeah. Also uh, near the Great Lakes, uh, Toronto area, Niagara region, actually. So. Oh, yeah. Toronto. Yeah, we were just in Toronto a few years ago. Yeah, and you'll like it there. Toronto's a lovely city, very progressive city, and uh, well, you've probably been there if your wife is from there. So yeah. I'm not telling... Yeah. So well, would, thank you, thank you. Would you would you say that um that 
like this that it sparked like a metamorphosis in you that it, it forced like it pushed you into growth because you have to like leave so much behind like attachments and stuff or well yeah yes uh i would i would say that absolutely it was a growth experience and it was it was difficult when i first got here i felt very uh i felt shaky i felt very emotional i had times where i would feel very uh, emotional um, and, you know, it's like Michael's son said to me right after I got here, she, he said, well, how does it feel? And I said, it, it doesn't really feel like I've immigrated. It just feels like I'm on, on a holiday, like I'm on vacation. And he said, well, you are only this time. It never ends. <laughs> um, so it took, a, it took a little while just adjusting to everything. And, you know, and I, I mean, I love Trini dearly. She was a wonderful woman, but her taste in decorating was nothing like mine is. And, um, and I'm a cancer, a double cancer. And so home is very important to me. And so I realized now that I was living here, it really wasn't a reflection of who I am and, 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 and how I wanted it to be. And Michael was wonderful. I mean, we redid everything over, over the next few years, you know, we did, he didn't care what I did. And, and we, we changed a lot of things around. I, I Americanized it a little bit more and, and, um, you know, but it was, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a, it was an adjustment period. I can't say that I just came in and everything was coming up roses. I never questioned what I did. I never doubted what I did. I knew I was exactly where I was meant to be, but it was a big move to go to the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. So you've traveled a lot, of course, too, with Michael. Um, you've, you met, you've met so many people. And um, how how was that for you? Like, how was that experience? How did you experience that? And how that did, they, did that experience feel for you? Because you must have met so many people, you know, all the intensives you did. I mean, I saw you on each intensive. Um, that must have been so enriching. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. You know, first of all, when we would arrive in a country, we always had just beautiful organizers just organized everything. So we weren't having to, you know, find our way from the airport to where we were staying, nothing like that. We were picked up and 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 always so well cared for. So that, that was a lovely aspect of everything as well. And the people were just absolutely beautiful, every single one. The people that attended the event, I'm sure you were there because you had read his books or at least you had heard something about him. So everyone was very, very familiar with Michael and very... Um, you know, they really loved him. They really cared for him. And, and it was beautiful to see how well received he was always in, in, in all the different countries and just meeting all those wonderful people. And it just made me think how many other wonderful people there are around the world that, that I've never met. So that was very, very heart opening as well. Yeah, it was beautiful. And then to see everything, we would be taken to all the lovely places, you know, when we would be when we would be in each country and and uh, I had really never been anywhere. I had, well, I had been to England once and Mexico once, but I hadn't traveled much. So that was really a big deal for me to do so much traveling. Yeah, that must be fantastic be, to be able to travel the world like this. It's, it's so enriching. I mean, I'm Sagittarius and Sagittarius love travel. So I can imagine yes. it would be uh, truly amazing. Yeah. yeah. So... How was it was I, I, I kind of wanted to ask this question how was it for you to you know to to just to to live with Michael because you know people like me we know Michael as you know the spiritual teacher who wrote amazing books you know who who was you know he was not the most famous spiritual teacher like he's that's always something that interested me but he was I mean he for me he was one of the best like he wasn't as famous like let's say Eckhart Tolle or something but he was he was famous he was world renowned but for me, the most, the the best, for me, he was one of the best. The, the, some of the best ones are not the most famous ones, which you which you see often recurring, uh, that in my opinion, anyway. Um, and of course, we know him as the spiritual teacher. You know, he had amazing metaphysical ability, he had an amazing energy. I mean, I could feel it when I was on the intensives. But how was it for you? Because you were on the other side, because he's, so, he's also a man, right? He has also his own character. He was also, a, a, and sometimes on the intensives, you could like kind of, you could see it, you could see, you see it seep through his, you know, his his day to day character. How was that for you to live, you know, with that? Dichot was it the dichotomy in a way of Michael the spiritual teacher and then Michael, the the your husband, or how was that for you? Well, you know, he was pretty much the same across the board. And I laugh when you say that about him being not famous because he used to always say, "I'm the most famous person that nobody's ever heard of," and. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> he did have a following, but certainly not like one of the, the big teachers. But, you know, decades ago when he first started this, uh, either Hilarion or Pan told him that he, he would be a teacher of teachers more than more than really world famous like the bit like the big names are and that's sort of how how that all unfolded but yeah he was pretty much um you know what you saw is what you got and he did have his personality quirks there was no question about that i mean they all do they all do and we were told over the years by people that had gone to other seminars with other uh, spiritual teachers or with c couples, you know, that were teaching, presenting seminars, how refreshing we were because we were so down to earth and we were so real. And the one, the one person said to me, I remember he was talking to a, uh, the woman, the wife of a couple that was presenting a, a weekend and, and she, uh, during a coffee break, and she looked at him and she said, oh, well, we're not like this at home. And he thought... <laughs> You know, well, duh, you know, why not? You know? But we were very much, um, very much what, when we were in front of people, you know, because when he would be talking, I would always add my little barbs and say things, or if he'd say something, I'd say, oh, Mr. Rhodes, you know, and then I'd call it to his attention, you know, that maybe he wasn't exactly practicing what he was preaching and everybody would laugh, <laughs> and, you know, so we were very authentic in that way. But our life at home was really, um, you know, pretty much the same. We we like a quiet life. We traveled so much when we would get home. We didn't really want to go places or do much. Um, we have a large property and a few ponds. And I have a huge aviary with a lot of finches and another aviary with bunch, budgie, budgery guards, parakeets, I think you might call them there. And, and uh, we just spent a lot of time at home. And then, of course, he did a lot of online courses after the lockdown. And that really kept him busy, more than traveling, really, because we would travel. And at least when we'd be gone for the four months, when we would get home, there'd be nothing. But then when we would online, then each of the countries, he would do German, French, English, and Japanese. And each country would do multiple courses. And so it was just like every night, you know, because uh, uh, except for Japan, because they're pretty much on the same time zone as we are. But everything on the other side of the world, he was having to be down here in the studio almost every night for long periods of time. And that was, you know, we, we realized we were going to have to, um, or we were going to have to adjust that, but then the cancer adjusted it for us. So we never got that far, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah before we, we go, I definitely also want to talk about, you know, Michael's cancer story and your story with that, uh, how you dealt with that and, and now afterwards. But before we go into that, um, I want to talk a little bit about, so you were saying you were forced into online work because, you know, the, the quote unquote health crisis, I won't say the word here because it's going to go on YouTube. Um, you know, it changed a lot for you guys, right? I mean, it was probably practically over with the traveling, right? We, yeah, it was. And it was sort of a, a shock to us because that was really our main source of income every year. And we had the whole tour planned for 2020. And then our, you know, our travel agent called and said, you're not going to be going anywhere. You're not going to be able to get out of the country and you won't be able to get into any other country. And so at that time, uh, Martin and Sasha, whose names you've probably heard from, you know, doing the online things, they had been encouraging Michael all along to start doing online uh, presentations. And Michael was just not into that, not into that at all. I mean, really not into that. And uh, but then when we weren't able to travel anymore, they said, OK, well, you can either A, stop presenting or B, you know, bite the bullet and learn how to do this. So he said, okay, okay, I'll try this. And they handled everything. They handled all the technical things, which we could have never done in a million years. I mean, he, you know, Michael did the content of course, but they, they created everything for us. And uh, the first five day event that he did online, there was a lot of hiccups in there technically. And he did, the presentation was good. His presentation was good, but he was really nervous and he kept looking around and he didn't know to look into the camera and, and, and talk to people like one-on-one -on -one in that way. And he was so used to presenting to, to large groups and, and live, it's much different to sit in a, in a studio where there's nothing, but you're just talking to a camera. And so he needed to polish himself up in that regard as well. And he definitely got better as the years went by, but that was a big learning curve for him, for all of us really to, to, to switch to online. But we were grateful we were able to do that. It was a blessing we were able to do that. Yeah, of course, a lot of people, and I, I can, I can kind of understand where Michael's trepidation came from because I also value like group connection and personal connection, like the intensive Michael were so fantastic, and 
the the online work it has its place it, it especially in, in in our times we have to adjust but i really like me me and my wife we do also things here in, in bruges where i live you know group meditations together and i really like it and you know i had a little bit of the same trepidation of doing doing online work but you have to you, like like you say you you have to do it um with that being said now that we're on the subject of you know the the p the health crisis is uh, what was really interesting to me is um as uh, like when I started on my spiritual journey, I also was into conspiracy, you know, conspiracy about, you know, what's go going really on behind the scenes, because I always felt for myself, it was important to have both. I mean, the love is the most important thing, but you have to have learned a certain level of, you know, what I would call streetwise by getting into the conspiracy. And that was never present in Michael's work. And, you know, I was when I got into Michael, like 15, more, more than 15 years ago, he never talked about it. But then recently i saw a little bit of a change he started delving more into these subjects too which i really appreciated because it showed to me he was a real person with integrity because a lot of people didn't dare to speak about that you know about yes. the conspiracy stuff like you know the i'm gonna say well i'm gonna say the word the jabs and stuff and uh, he yeah. really spoke out against that and you know what he what he said i kind of already knew because of you know my uh 20-year journey in, in, into conspiracy uh, but I really appreciated that, and even in his book, his latest book, he, you know, he delves into it a little bit at the end of the of the of his book. It was a really an intense scene he describes also, and you know, I kind of want to ask you is like, how was that for you also and for Michael? Because um, a lot of people came from you know this pure, purely spiritual background, and a lot of people are kind of challenged by this you know darker information coming out. Um, how was that for? And I know Michael probably lost a lot of people for that. I kind of suspect. Um, so how was that process for you personally too? Did you know about this before? Did it go with Michael? How was it for Michael? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I heard about it when everyone else heard about it. I mean, I would read about it when you were reading about it. I didn't, I didn't edit his Facebook uh, pages or his Facebook posts, but he, yes, he was very outspoken and very much, um, uh, you know, he's like an Aries razor's, razor's edge. He cuts right to the core. He doesn't like, he doesn't monkey around. And he ended up in, uh, you know, he, he was, I don't know if I can say this Facebook prison, you know, more than once for some of the comments that he made. And, and, uh, uh, I, my, for me personally, I think he could have been a little bit more diplomatic about it. I mean, people have their choice. If they felt, you know, drawn to do whatever they were drawn to do, it was their choice. You know, we made our decision what worked for us, but everybody has the right to choose what's right for them. And I've always been much more diplomatic. You know, Michael would always say, I take them apart and you put them back together. <laughs> but, you know, he, he would say, I'm so diplomatic. He said, you can tell people to go to hell in such a way they can't wait to get there. But, <laughs> I would, I would have been a little bit more, um, you know, balanced and not so not so cut and and, and dry. Uh, and he did lose people. He definitely lost several people. A lot of people. Even a couple of our organizers um, were, you know, not not on the same page with that. And and they and they backed away, which didn't matter because we weren't going to be traveling again anyhow. But um, he also gained a lot of people that were more, you know, in line on that same page that he was. And but those people weren't necessarily uh, spiritually inclined. You know, they were more conspiracy theorists or more, um, you know, on that on that that one single train of thought. They weren't really, you know, but I mean, they, they maybe didn't even realize what the word enlightened meant. You know, a lot of people don't even realize what that word is. So I think probably a lot of them did drop away after that all kind of boiled down to nothing. But then, you know, when he started making his cancer diagnosis public, which he did almost immediately, uh, we seem to have gotten a lot more people then as well. I mean, the, the the likes and the shares and everything on on Facebook really went went way up when he was uh, sharing his his journey and in a very authentic and raw way. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that because um, I think I feel it's important for there's so much people going through this, you know. Um, so much people having loved ones, you know, uh, dying of cancer. Um, I mean, I had uh, had it happen with my mom. It was the same thing. Um, so can you t talk us a little bit about, you know, the first steps, like how how did Michael handle it? How did you handle it? Because I know it's 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 a huge thing. It's, it has a huge emotional impact. And especially because you both were so, you know, spiritual, um, you know, that did that, did that change it in any way? Like how did you deal with it with the first, you know, with the news and... 
Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, well, he started to get sick in January. Uh, we both had the, the flu, the fashionable flu, I call it. And um, he, and where I recovered, he really never did. He never did. And we thought it was, you know, just the repercussions and the, and the flu dragging out. And then he started losing weight. And that is never a good sign, uh, especially for an older person to be losing weight for no, no reason. And his children were all encouraging him to go to the doctor. And he is not a doctor person, has never been a doctor person at all. And even, even I started to encourage him to go. I said, let's just see what we're dealing with. You know, let's know what we're dealing with so we can move forward. I said, you know, you don't have to practice any protocol or do what they suggest, but let's just see what we're up against here. And uh, no, 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 he didn't want to go. And then uh, one night in the middle of June, um, he looked at me. He said, I think I'm dying. And he said, I need to, I need to see a doctor. I need to go to the hospital. I need to do something. And I called first thing in the morning and um, we went in to see uh, a, a GP that we really didn't know because we really never went to a doctor. And she sent him for blood tests and uh, a scan, a body scan. And that was on a Wednesday and on Thursday at dinner time, uh, they called from the clinic and they said, um, we got your test results and uh, they're very worrying and you're going to have to go to the emergency room at university hospitals right away. They, they're expecting you. We've sent all their, all, the, all your, all your test results there. Well, that was a, <laughs> you know, that's not good news. So we knew certainly something serious was, was going on. And uh, so we, they did all tests and everything there. And then, and then they came in and we were there that we, we got there on Thursday night and, and then on Friday night, they came in with the test results and, um, and said that it was a cancer and that it was terminal. It was in his prostate and it had spread to his bones and into his lungs. And that they really was nothing that they could do because of his age. They didn't, you know, they wouldn't do chemotherapy or radiation, which he wouldn't have done anyhow. And that was, I have to say, an, an enormous shock for both of us. It wasn't so much a shock that it was cancer, but the fact that it was so far progressed and so, you know, and that they were just saying it was terminal. There's nothing that, that could be done. And uh, that that was, we were, I think we were both really in, in shock by that because we both felt he would, you know, you know, we both felt we would live to be a really great age. I mean, he always talked about being a long liver and having a, a great long life. He probably said that at the events that you attended. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, and, you know, and then of course, why would I have created this? How, how could this have happened? And uh, so that, you know, that was started a big deep dive into, into self, into the depths of, of self and, and, um, uh, we uh, we went home then on Monday. We checked out, and his older oldest son owns Nexus Magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with Nexus Magazine. Uh, it's an international, uh, and it, you know they deal with all cutting edge technology and and a lot of a lot of things that most um, mainstream things don't don't deal with. And so Duncan put together a whole holistic protocol that we followed. And uh, and Michael was really getting better. He was showing improvements and his, um, even his blood tests were better. You know, we were still sort of keeping up with the doctor and, you know, for just for tests and listen to his lungs and, and different things. And, and he was really improving. He was going up and down the stairs again. The coughing had really subsided, which was really quite violent. And, you know, we really felt that uh, he had turned the corner and that, you know, maybe we'd get another couple of years at least out of out of this. And uh, but then right after Christmas, just this past Christmas, he was good on Christmas. And then, boom, he just, whoa, just started sliding down. It was like his soul had a just change of heart, change of direction. And um, he just pretty much went downhill from from that time on until he he passed the end of April, April 28th. So it was uh, it was quite a process, I have to say. There's looking death in the face is a is a very is a very powerful teacher, and for me as well. And we were so intertwined. We were so, I mean, we'd always been very close. We've happily lived in each other's pockets for many years, and and we were very very seldom apart. But this really really was a whole new level of of intimacy, of soul intimacy, and. Um, 
just going through all this. You know, it was interesting. There were so many aha moments for both of us, but it was never really anything new. It was things that we already thought we had dealt with. But then, you know, it's never a straight line. It's never a straight line. It's a spiral. And you come back, you know, uh, to the same place and things that you thought you had cleared, you thought you had healed and realize, okay, deeper. It's always a deeper level, always deeper level, always more growth. The growth never ends. And so that there was a lot of that going on. And Michael said at the end that he actually learned more in the last six months than he had in his whole previous life. And that's saying a lot because, you know, he traveled the multiverse and did have mm -hmm. a lot of experiences with a lot of different beings and learned learned a lot. And, and so that was a, a lot for him to say. But this was, I think, about his own personal growth about being humble, about, you know, just, you know, various things that he realized that he, he really hadn't been, you know, he hadn't really embraced fully. So it was all worth it. You know, the growth experiences that we both had uh, would have never occurred if not, if not for this. And as difficult as that is for me to say, it certainly wouldn't have been my preference for this. I can tell you that without hesitation. It was the last thing that we wanted. But you know, it's like we said, would, it, would this be easier five years from now, 10 years from now? I mean, sooner or later, every couple goes through this, you know, where one one goes and one, one stays. And uh, we never just, we never thought about it. I mean, we both thought we were gonna live on at least into our early hundreds. We but you know the soul is on a journey and not necessarily what our ego identity wants it to do <laughs> so and as far as the soul is concerned it really doesn't care our soul the soul that we are is concerned it doesn't care what it puts the physical form through as long as there's growth in consciousness because that's the reason that we're here we're growth mm -hmm. in consciousness mm -hmm. yeah i that's a question I want to ask you because you know, with with a process like this, there's also, of course, a, a some a, a, an amount, a certain amount of suffering, right? Physical suffering. Um, of course, when you when you when you have when you go through that process, I mean, um, it's not easy. And when you see people, you know, become really skinny and and, and really struggling. Um, so it's it's a it's a kind of an intense learning experience for for a soul. And some people I've I've heard some people say, and this, this was like the last days a theme that played in my head. And I kind of want to ask you about this. Is some people say, why would why would a soul or why would God put people through this? And I was thinking about it. Yeah, and I because you know we have the, you know the spiritual perspective. Um, of of course the soul wants to learn, but what what, what would you say to people who say that? Well, what I what I feel about that is that uh, as the soul is preparing to go, it doesn't. It, it, it everything is in perfect timing, and as long as the soul thinks there's still something to learn, there's some growth that can be that can be handled, that can be that can be gleaned out of out of this process. It'll it'll hang on. It'll still stay there, and. The growth that Michael was having, he was draining off baggage, draining off things that hadn't been healed, letting go, letting go. So when he did make the transition, he could go to a higher frequency. He wasn't carrying all this, this uh, you know, mental, emotional uh, trauma, baggage that he that had that he had 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 still within him, still within him, and not just from this lifetime, but from lifetimes gone by. I mean, when he was doing one of the processes, which was uh, he was laying on heat mats, uh, which are actually medically registered some hospital uses use hospitals use them for for cancer treatments along with other other treatments as well but it, you know he was laying on this heat mat at 70 degrees celsius with another heat mat on top of them with 70 degrees and they, it's a pro there's other things in the heat mats other than just to heat but it's it's the same process as chemotherapy or radiation you know it's the heat that kills kills the cancer cells but this just kills the cancer cells not not all the other cells as well. And so when he was laying on this heat pet mat for an hour, I was reading to him out of getting there, um, or the boy with no shadow as it is in, in German. And uh, and in that, it was a it was a, a novel. It was not a, a true story, but it was really based very heavily on his life. And there was a lot of his past lives that he, that he um, incorporated into the story. And when, when we were reading, when I was reading out loud these past lives, I mean, some of these paragraphs that I was reading, some of these pages, he could have written it that same day. I mean, it was the same things, you know, that the main character in the book was going through. It was, he was facing right then, you know, 
30 years later, however long it was, that book came out in the late 90s. And, you know, so that was sort of a, an eye opener. And he had a lot of emotional releases through that, uh, you know, dealing with his father and, and uh, you know, he would he would just cry and I would cry. <laughs> we, we did a lot of crying. And and um, so, there, you know, there was still a lot in him that needed to be that to, needed to be released, not from just from this lifetime, but from lifetimes gone by, as I said, which is all happening right now. Anyhow, so well, you know, we won't go into that. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a beautiful way of seeing it, and like like it, it, everything has its function. I remember Michael saying also, I think in one of the intentions is even people with dementia, it's also a way if they get dementia before they die of letting go of certain emotional issues, regressing them back to their childhood, so that the soul can release certain issues. So I remember him talking about that. It's really really interesting, and it's really interesting that you bring it up because this you know brings the you know suffering of the dead process. In a different light, of course, because to the soul it has some value. Uh, that's that's very interesting. And and how was how was it for for you, Carolyn? Like, because you of course you you've seen the man that you loved physically transform. Um, how was that? How was that process for you? That was very very difficult, of course. Um, in the early months, because he was improving, that was really what was keeping me going because he was getting better and better. And then after the first of the year, when he started going downhill and we were having a really hot, humid summer and he was really having trouble breathing. And I said to him one day, okay, he was in a wheelchair at that point. Um, let's go to the plaza, you know, where it's air conditioned and, and, and you'll, and you'll feel better there. And the last time we'd gone to the plaza, you know, he was getting up and, and pushing the wheelchair, like as a walker and, and moving himself around a little bit. And then I would push him a little bit and then he'd walk a little bit. So he was doing pretty well. So I was sort of hoping for that same, uh, you know, result when we went, uh, but after we had been there for about a half an hour, it was not improving his breathing at all. And I knew then, I just knew in my heart that, you know, things had, had really turned around. And uh, and that's when it got it got more difficult. It definitely got more difficult. He was, his breathing became more challenged. I, I ended up taking a, a roll away bed into the TV room where we have a, an, a recliner, an electric re recliner chair, which was the most comfortable for him to be in um, because he couldn't lay flat anymore. He had to keep himself elevated. And we have one in the bedroom as well, but the one in the, in the TV room was, was more comfortable. And, you know, I was having trouble sleeping at night. I was always listening for him breathing, if he was still breathing and, and just watching the man that you cherish more than anything, um, just waste away like that. And to have all of his physical, um, you know, everything, eating, drinking, walking, uh, you know, breathing, all, all of the things that we take for granted so much to have those be taken, taken away from him, the limitations were were really a, a struggle for him. And actually, he he suffered more mentally and emotionally with all this, I feel, than he did physically. He had a lot of little niggles and aches and pains, but even like Hospice said, and like our dear friend Bruno, a, reti a retired doctor said, he could have been in such worse pain physically, much, much worse pain than he was. I mean, he didn't have any real, really severe pain. And and so that I was grateful for that, but he was uncomfortable. He was never comfortable, you know. He, there was always a, a degree of of, of of discomfort, you know, to one level or another. But as far as really severe pain, he never had that. So so that was a blessing. That was a blessing. And uh, right at the end, um, you know, I could see him withdrawing. You know, as the veil was thinning, he was withdrawing from me. He was withdrawing from because a lot of people were coming by to to see him and and just withdrawing from life, withdrawing from everything. And and uh, and his passing was very gentle. It was very gentle. You know, I was listening to him breathing, listening to him breathing, and uh, he was in a hospital bed at that point in in our bedroom. And um, and uh, I finally fell asleep. I think about one o'clock. And a friend of ours was staying here, a retired nurse. Uh, and uh, she had been with her father and her partner both when they transitioned from home. And she said she'd been here for three weeks, and she said that she thought I had maybe bitten off more than I could chew, and she was exactly right. I didn't realize at the end. I could not have done it on my own. I couldn't physically handle it. And the lack of sleep and, you know, just the emotional and mental exhaustion was just extraordinary. And, 
And so having her here was an enormous, enormous help for me. And I finally fell asleep and then she came in and she sat in the in the chair and 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 waited up and and uh, and then uh, she listened and she said his breathing just slowed down and um, and then it just stopped about three o'clock in the morning. And so he had a very, a very gentle, gentle passing. And, Mm-hmm. And I'm sure a spectacular homecoming. I have no doubt about that. But it was, uh, sorry. <laughs> it was fine. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough. It was a blessing in disguise. It was very bittersweet at the end because he was, you know, so, you know, he couldn't eat, he couldn't drink. You know, we were having to put cotton swabs in his mouth to wet his mouth. And I mean, he just couldn't do anything anymore. And you don't want to see, you know, anyone suffer to that degree. But then the, the void that it left in the, in our home was extraordinary. I mean, he was a very powerful energy, a very, very powerful energy. Even when he was ill, you know, I mean, his physical body was, was going down the tubes, but, you know, his, his, his being, the being that he is, was still very, very much there. And after he left, everyone that came over at that point, the minute they walked in the door, they said it's so apparent that you know he was he was not not here anymore. His his physical presence was gone. So life goes on, and uh, yeah, like I said, my I felt like my like like a, a tree whose whose leaves had been stripped bare in a cyclone, but the you know my roots are deep, and the new growth is starting to emerge, and. I'm strong. I'm strong. He said he looked at the whole thing metaphysically and he said, you're much stronger than you, than you realize you are. And I knew that in my heart. And he said, you're going to be fine. And I said, I know, I know, but I did grieve. I definitely, I grieved <laughs> Absolutely. and still do a little bit. I still have waves of emotion as you just wit- witness and that go by and that probably will, well, I'll probably always have that. I don't know. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's perfectly normal. I mean, we as a human, as a human being, we we have to go through the healing to to, to the grieving process. And you know, Michael talked a lot about uh, attachments. And in my opinion, as a human being, it's it's almost impossible to not have attachments because we we tend to get attached, you know. And, and that's just the way of it. And I don't think it's a bad thing. Well, how do you feel about like at- attachments and and yes. and. and- I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And where, you know, we read, you know, attachments are not are not good for your spiritual path. Michael would talk about it, it's like tying a dog to the leg of a table and then going to the door and saying, come on, let's go for a walk. And, and the dog might get to the door, but it's not going to get through the door. You know, it's attached to the table and it's pretty much the same thing. But I think for the level of consciousness that we are right now on, you know, especially the masses, uh, I think that uh, attachment is a very is a very human thing. It's a very human thing and something that we're meant to experience. And Michael always said that out of all the beings that he met and all the different timelines and, and realities that he visited, that he didn't meet anyone ever that had the, the depth and the richness of emotions that we do. And so I, I feel we're very much meant to feel these emotions, very much meant to feel that. And he also said that the grief was not natural. I I disagree. I disagree with that. I think when you reach a certain level of consciousness, it probably isn't natural. But for the level that we are, I find it to be very, very natural and very necessary as well. You don't want to bottle things up because that's certainly not going to work for you either. And when Trini passed, when his when his uh, late wife passed, he grieved big time. I mean, he definitely grieved that. So when he was saying that grief isn't natural I don't believe that was coming from his personal experience because he definitely grieved and he dealt with attachment issues then as I did when my when my ex-husband and I divorced when we separated you know we thought we had that nailed we thought okay been there done that and and when we when we got married we said we don't have to do that and and we really believed that I mean we really felt that that we didn't but then as the years went by and then you know one year after the next after the next 18 years um, we fell right back into that pattern, into that default program. And and we were very aware of it when we realized that we were coming to the finish line, we were coming to the end of our rainbow, that we were very attached. And that's fine. And I have no, no, uh, no problems with that. But as I said in a recent, as I wrote about in, in, in Facebook, I realized every, every uh, trauma that I've had in my whole life has been the root has been attachment issues. So I've had to I've had to look at that as well. 
And the thing is, it's not, you know, you grieve and you feel that, but it's not to let the grief turn into self-pity. You know, you have to deal with your emotions, but sooner or later, you know, you have to, you have to rise, you have to rise up out of it. And yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting yeah. that you say that because yeah, self self pity can be a real self self sabotage that keeps you in that like more of a, a a lower state. And in my opinion, I've heard Michael talk also about you know lower emotions, and but I feel like lower emotions are also part of our human beingness, right? We have to like I like that Michael also spent attention on that you know in his inner in, inner exercises and stuff. Like some spiritual teachers, which I don't consider. Um, Oh, I wouldn't follow. Let me say it like that. They they kind of ignore the, the the lower emotions, and but it's part of our human being, right? We have to we have to we have to feel everything. It like you say, it would be bad to to push it down. Those those negative experiences, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we absolutely have to deal with that and recognize. But I think I think it's important to when you have really low emotions that are that are kind of like you know running the show. You know that you're really locked into not just situational things, but when it's an ongoing pattern that you have. I think it's important to recognize those. You know, and to realize and to ask yourself. You know, why am I telling myself that, or where am I getting this idea from? You know, so often it's like hand me down beliefs from our families, from our cultures, our religions, our you know, I mean, it, 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 it really start questioning where is this coming from, and and is this true? Am I telling myself the truth, and and, and really acknowledging these and 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 diving a little bit deeper, not just letting them run your life, not you know, not letting them, not letting them navigate your life, being the only thing that's navigating your life. And I think that's what Michael was trying to to bring up to make people aware of what they were feeling and why and how they can rise, how they can lift above that. They don't have to wallow in that. And then gradually, gradually, the more you realize you're in that state again, you know, of guilt or depression or whatever it is, uh, you know, and you see that and you and you can pull yourself up. And then the more you see it and the more you pull yourself up, then you get more you can pull yourself up quicker. And then you get to the point where you don't really have to go there anymore. And that that takes time. It, it takes a while to come out to the come off the battlefield of self-criticism and self-betrayal. But we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's actually what Michael taught me too, because in the beginning of my spiritual journey, I was into shadow work a lot, but actually you have to do the light work. I would consider what Michael did light work, raise the frequency. And then, you know, when you raise the frequency enough, the shadow will come up, lower emotions will come up to the surface to be released. And it's like you say, an ongoing process. And I'm very grateful for Michael for, you know, putting that focus on love. Um, Cause that's really what I took away from all of his teachings. And he would repeat it over as you, as you, as you all, of course know, he would repeat it over and over again, you know, love, love, love. And that really put it into my mind, like love, love is the big thing. Um, and it was just such a beautiful energy to experience because you could feel the love, that unconditioned love, you could feel it at the intensives and it really had an effect. I remember after my first intensive, I, I was like, I was walking in the su in the in the supermarket and I was feel like feeling from another dimension. It was such a, a big, big, big difference in energy, the, the 5D intensives and then the the regular life um did you how was that experience of of love for you how 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 has the experience of love deepened for you through the years uh well i think that um i think from many many years ago i i looked at love like i think that most of the masses do that it's a very personal love it's you know for family for children you know for your closest friends your parents and and just you know it's very very personal when it isn't personal at all, it has nothing to do with personal, personal love. That's that's kindergarten love, as I call it. It's you know, love, as Michael always says, it's the power of creation. It's absolutely the power of creation. It's the frequency of the multiverse. It's the you know, it's the nourishment of life. It's the it's the energy that activates and animates all life, from the micro atoms to the to the to the you know to the multiverse. It's uh, it, it's we can't we can't look for love we can't find love because we are love you know we we equate it as an emotion and it, it's not it's not an emotion it's a frequency it's an energy and and you know we can't grab onto it we can't hold on to it because it's a it's a feeling it's a it's a uh, it's an experience you know we can't like mentally get there because you know you can't get there. it's like the Tao that can be spoken it's not the Tao and 
I would like to say that I equate love or I, you know, for me, love, God, source, nature, God, goddess, all that is, supreme creation, that's all the same energy. It's all, it's all the same energy. And to tap into that divine, you know, to our divine self, to the divinity that we are, I think is, is a step that, that everyone is taking right now, that absolutely everyone is taking. That's the next stage of our, of our evolution. It's like our hearts have been frozen in time for thousands, thousands, thousands of years. And now with the frequency rising, the frequency rising, it's like our, our hearts are melting with our own luminosity, our own luminosity, and we're discovering the divinity within, and and the, and we're it's like we're realizing the truth of our being that God was born in human form, and and we're the living proof, we're the living proof of that, and we're connecting with that, and I think that that's very that's very powerful because we're moving into an age of you know love and compassion, and how can I help you, and what can I do for you, you know, and not what in it for me and greed and control and that's going to happen regardless you know i mean i know the governments of the world are going crazy right now and who knows what's going to happen but it will all collapse i mean love wins <laughs> it's going to win one way or another and i think more than how it's going to collapse we need to think what we're going to do when it does and how we're going to build ourselves back up and it's the consciousness of the people that have to that have to rise the consciousness of the people that that have that has to change and that's what's happening now that's what's happening now you know it's a very exciting there's a there's a tsunami of love that's a silent tsunami not so silent even anymore of love that's sweeping the planet and um yeah it's it's beautiful we're very blessed to be here right now even though it's crazy but this is a we stood in a long long line to be here for this this transition absolutely yeah yeah, it's, yeah, like you say, it's a tsunami of love that's breaking down the old structures and sweeping down the old structures and they're still trying to grasp it. It's going to go anyway. And I feel like what you and Michael did in your travel, it's like preparing, you were like already paving the way for that new wave, new wave of new way of consciousness, for that new wave of consciousness that's going to be coming more apparent on the earth in this in this century, actually. Uh, that's that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I think we can, one last question, maybe we can end on this beautiful note. Um, you know, Michael talked about, you know, visiting, um, you know, the fifth higher dimensions where, you know, was really, I was found it so fascinating to read next to all his wisdom, of course, his metaphysical travels. Um, and he talked about, you know, visiting the higher dimensions and visiting actually his and your soul aspect uh, in, in a higher dimension. Um, have you ever um, experienced anything like that? Have you ever had like, um, you know, any experiences that what Michael referenced uh, that you also maybe by 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 hearing it for Michael or by living it, Michael, um, experienced this the same thing. No, in a word, <laughs> I was not able to to travel as he was. I've had you know when I was having a lot of lucid dreaming when I was younger. Uh, I had a couple of experiences where, as I look back, I recognize that you know I was connecting with my divine self. I didn't know what it was at the time, but as I as I look back on it, I know I have had some experiences, but certainly not to the level or anything close to, to what Michael has. Michael's been doing this for a lot of lifetimes. You know, mm -hmm. this isn't his first uh, go around with, with traveling metaphysically. So he was a, a well well developed at, at that. But no, I had I had none of none of that. I had none of that and I have had no personal experiences uh, with, with it at all. So that answers that. That's easy. That was an easy question. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I think we're at the end of the interview. Is there anything, uh, Carolyn, that you want to share? Any message that you want to still uh, still bring out there for the for the viewers? No, just choose love. That's you know, that's our that's our main message. When, when before Michael left, he he wanted me to promise him, and I did many times to carry on to carry on the, the message of love to keep spreading the love bug. So, uh, and it's just such an easy thing to do. You know, there's like eight billion pe people on the planet, and if everybody just chose love, we could change it in a heartbeat in a nanosecond. And just simple things, you know, it doesn't have to be any great, big, you know, just be, be kind, just be kind, be loving to people, be, you know, be nice, be grateful, feel grateful, unconditional love, I think that gratitude, feeling gratitude is very much a similar feeling to opening to, to the love, to opening to the love in your heart. And just, you know, love who you are, love who you've been, love who you're going to be, love who you're with, love what you do, and just love. Just love and love well. And it's really easy. It's our true nature. It's our core essence. Just blow the dust off and, and love.
that's beautiful yeah so um for people who are watching this who maybe are not following you you uh, you on social media you're still active on michael's page um yeah so still it should still it's still his name my name isn't on there i was writing on it for so long before he left and the only difference is now there's a picture of he and i together on it and when i write i always write hi everyone carolyn here which now that's you know it's just me nobody else says he's not going to be him but i continue to write that because sometimes other people post things on there uh yeah and michaelrhodes.com is uh is still is still up and uh, you know our website of course is still active and actually right now we're putting together all the inner exercises uh and we're going to make them available um either individually or in in bundles and clusters which is something that we've never done before they've only been available through the courses so we're going to to make the inner exercises available and and uh i'm actually going to be doing a course uh, I don't know when uh, coming up. I've been encouraged from a lot of different people to do this. So I'll just do a little, you know, seminar or something, something short and sweet, but uh, I'll carry on. And I do want to keep Michael's legacy alive. He was a, a brilliant, a brilliant man and still is a brilliant being. And um, yeah, we're going to, I'm going to do what I can to keep, to keep his message going. Yeah. That's beautiful. Cause I, um, about keeping message uh, Michael's legacy going, um, you know, me and me and Meg, we do events here in, in Bruges, and I and I asked, uh, I kind of want to. When I first started out with this a few years ago, like I want to play the "I Love You" song, but you know, that was of course like one one big thing that Michael uh, used. And I was like, am I not copying him? And then I asked, I asked permission to Nana and Anki. Nana and Anki, is it okay if I use your song? Uh, and, and and sometimes we use it so in a way you know it made me think like we we did a trip to england and we we, we used it there and people loved it so much and they kept asking for it and i was like oh in, in a way it's keeping michael's legacy alive a little bit uh, it was i i it felt really good when we were doing it on, on our retreat so it was very beautiful so yeah so uh thank you carolyn thank yeah, you so much well, for uh go ahead well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to have a chat with you. And you have a beautiful energy. You really do. I recognized your name. And, and when I saw your face, I recognized your face as well. But uh, we've never, I don't remember chatting with you. I know you said we did talk a few years ago, but you have a, a really lovely energy. And I wish you all the very best in your move to Canada. And, uh, and thank you again. And thank you, everyone who's watching. Thank you very much. And choose love. Remember to choose love. And I love you. I love you all. Thank you. Absolutely. So thanks for watching, everybody. And if you like this content, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm going to be doing more of these. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Carolyn. And see you next time. Bye bye.